where there's a warp, there's a way. An Org Short Story by Mike Brooks. Narrated by Nicholas McGee. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Ufthuk Blackhawk, Bad Moon Warrior and definite second biggest in the Bad Geek Snaz Hammers mob. No matter what that Zoggin idiot Mogrot thought, raised his voice in a rolling, rollicking war cry as they piled into the old breaker. Outside in the cold vacuum of space, the Mechlord's war fleet was busy, crumping the Umi ships. But that wasn't Uftuk's fight. Blowing stuff up from a long way off was fine in its way, but he preferred getting up close and personal. Let the gun boys have their fun. Uftuk was on his way to the real fight. The last boys piled in, along with Doc Drazfang, and one of the war boss's most trusted mechs. The boffin had replaced his own legs with a single wheel powered by a fuel made by concentrated squig dung. Uftok had never worked out how the boffin stayed upright on it, since even the war bikes needed at least two wheels, plus either a kickstand or a rider's legs, or a kickstand made from someone else's leg. On the few occasions they were stationary when Uftok had asked a boffin, I just started talking about whirly bits inside it, as though that made any sense. The last hatch slammed shut, and the flyboys in the cockpit whooped, firing up the engines and vaporizing anything immediately behind the shuttle. Uftok had been on boarding missions before, so he knew what to do. Grab onto one of the handholds roughly welded into the walls, and hang on like a grot on a war bore. The flyboy captain stamped down on the lever, which released the mag clamp fastening them to the deck of the Mechlord's Fury. And then they were away. Immediately, all the boys who hadn't been in an old breaker before went flying to the back of the rear of the ship, and they were crushed into a painful and indigent heap against the metal bulkhead. Ulftuk laughed uproariously as they tumbled past him with expressions of confusion plastered across their faces. The breakers got up to full speed quickly, so it was only a few moments before the G-forces subsided enough for the newbies to untangle themselves from each other and start the important process of working out whose gun was whose. If you gets don't settle down, then I'm turning this thing around. Boss Snazhammer stormed down the shuttle, spittle flying from his gob as he kicked boys out of the way. He was a huge orc, head and shoulders taller than the rest of them, and bedecked in the most ostentatious finery that teeth could buy. And since he was a bad moon, he had a lot of teeth. There was barely a surface on his armor that wasn't decorated with loot. Whether that was metals taken off the corpses of Umi bosses, those little bits of wax paper from the armor of the dead beakies, or even some fancy gems the pointy ears wore. In his right hand, he carried a massive weapon that had given him his second name, a metal shaft the height of a umi with its legs still attached, with a hammer on one side of the head and a chopper blade on the other. The entire head could be engulfed in a crackling power field with one flick of the snaz hammer's clawed thumb, and Iftok had seen the boss smash right through a umi tank with it. The boys ducked their heads, grabbed their own shooters, and tried to avoid the boss's eye. No one wanted to end up like that tank. That's better. As Hammer growled, he turned on the spot addressing the entire old breaker. Right, we ain't the only old breaker what's flying today. Boos and jeers. But we got the most important job. As Hammer continued. The mech lord himself told me what we got to do, so you all best listen. The mob quieted down as much as it ever would. If the Mechlord told them what to do, they'd probably better do it. The Mechlord was no ordinary war boss, if there was such a thing. He was the biggest big mech, and his gear was legendary. He'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with rival war boss Old Fang Crump Thunder. And after one hit with the Mechlord's shock hammer, no one had found any part of the goth larger than a finger. The Mechlord's personal force field could shrug off hits from a Humi Titan cook cook cannon, and his super shooter could cut a death dread in half before he could say Gork and Mork. He was what any bad moon wanted to be, massive, art as nails, and carrying enough weapons and armor to kit out a small warband in his own right. No, Snazhammer declared. Umis don't got Gork and Mork to guide them through the warp. To take them where the next fight is, they gotta use some fancy worky bits what they keeps in the middle of their ships. What we got to do is get the buff in there. He's gonna do some mech stuff. Got it? There was general muttering, nodding of heads. The Snazhammer beamed. Good. Now then, who are we? Snazhammer's mob! The assembled mass of orcs bellowed. Uftok amongst them. Are we the biggest? Yes! Are we the baddest? Yes! Are we the shootiest? 
Yes! The mob yelled, and everyone waved their shooters, which were almost all custom jobs with extra DACA. No one pulled the trigger yet, though, which was good. Hook Talk had once been in an old breaker where some git with a cannon had managed to crack the flyboy seeing window, and it turned out there was a reason why these things weren't open-topped. That's what I thought, Snazhammer said with grim satisfaction. He reached up and grabbed a handhold overhead. Now everyone hold on to something. Hoofdalk had known this was coming and reached up with his other hand. Old breakers flew quick. There was a shudder as the shuttle's short-range torpedoes all fired at once, concentrating on a small part of the enemy's ship hull to weaken it. Hoofdalk began counting down. Five, four, three, two, one. He frowned. Bit of one. The old breaker smashed into the Umi ship. Its specially reinforced nose cone taking the brunt of the impact and punching them clean through the interior. The force of the sudden deceleration lifted Uftok's boots from the floor and nearly wrenched his arms from their sockets, but he held firm. Some of the new lads who hadn't minded the boss's words enough went flying the other way down the shuttle. One of them collided with a support strut hard enough to snap his back clean in two, much to the disdain of the other boys who had managed to remain upright. Leave him! Snazhammer bellowed as a few of them started putting the boot in. We've got Umis to paste. Get out there and get clobbering. He aimed a kick at the downed orc's head as he acted on his own words, and his steel toe cut hit hard enough to knock it right off. Dark blood sprayed out across the nearby members of the mob, while the flying head caught a lurking grok clean in the chest and knocked it backwards into the wall. Wark! Hooftalk drew his weapons and surged forwards with the massive green around him. This was life. This was what it meant to be to be an orc. Enemies in front of him, lads around him, ammo in his slugger, and a good right arm to swing his chopper. What more could anyone ask for? The four hatches burst outwards, and the boys spilled out. Hooftalk shouldered his way forwards, looking for something to kill. They busted through into a vast chamber of metal, the ceiling of which arched up overhead into a gloomy shadow. The walls looked consist mainly of pipes, cables, and contact points, some of which spat blue and white sparks, which Uftok couldn't see much of them. That was partly because of the strange Umi machines which loomed throughout the chamber. Strange even to him, who'd fought a lot of different Umis in a lot of different places, and partly because the Umis that crewed the ship decided that they wanted to fight. They were already swarming inwards, like buzzer squigs converging on an intruder into their nest. Uftok saw the red robes in the first flashes of gunfire and grunted in recognition. Umi mech boys. No wonder the mech lord had his eyes on something fancy. Umi tech could do some pretty wild stuff, so long as you didn't hit it too hard. The red robes slowed, setting themselves to shoot, and Uftok groaned. Why did Umis never want to fight properly? Only beakies ever fancied a real rumble, and they didn't even taste good once you got them out of their armor. The rest of them got close enough for you to smell them then hung back to shoot like mork damned death skulls. They also always seemed to think that the boys would just stand still. All right, lads, have them. Snazhammer bellowed, and then the mob surged forwards. Uftok could feel Mork urging him on, and then time slowed. His strides seemed to eat up the metal deck beneath him, and the figures in the Umi gun line grew larger with each step. He saw an individual barrel track towards him, saw the Umi's trigger tighten on the trigger, but he took his next step at an angle, and Mork smiled upon him, because the bolt of spitting energy flew past his head instead of taking him full in the face. The next shot hit him in the shoulder, the white cold shock that staggered him for a moment, but Uftok had taken worse in the past. And the Umi had gone for the kill instead of turning to run while it could. Not all of its fellows had done the same. Some of them were already fleeing in the face of the unstoppable green tide bearing down upon them. Uftok bared his fangs bellowed his war cry and cannon into the Umi line with the rest of the mob. The Umi who'd shot him tried to parry his chopper with his rifle. Uftok gave it respect for the effort, but nothing for the execution, because his blade smashed through the spindly weapon and split the torso from neck to the middle of its chest. Like most Umis, it died after one hit, sagging to the floor as he wrenched his chopper free and fired his shooter to what passed for the face of another. Although this one was wearing a lot more metal there than most Umis did. The metal didn't help it. Uftuk's sluggish shot blew its head apart, metal face and all, and it dropped as well. A Humi lunged at him, wielding some sort of spear. The blade buried itself in Uftuk's chest, and then he bellowed in pain. 
then booted the wielder in its stomach. It flew backwards, disappearing with a despairing wail into the rolling maul of bodies around Boss Snazhammer. Uftok wrenched the spear out. It turned out to be one of those electro guns with a knife stuck on it, and threw it after its owner. There was a roar of anger, and Uftok grinned as Magrat Redtooth whirled around and clobbered at Umi, which had nothing to do with the fact that there was now a knife in his back. Next to Uftok, Defro had lost his chopper, probably stuck in the ribcage of a dead Umi somewhere, and so was using the next best thing, a stick bomb. He battered one Umi aside into the path of Doc Drazfang, who carved it apart with the power claw. He called the surgeon, broke the skull of another, and then wound up and took a swing at a third. The world went white, very loud and extremely sharp. Uftok realized he was on the floor, alongside everyone else within three yards of Defro. Defro himself was on his back, staring stupidly at the handle clutched in his somewhat shredded fist. They go bang, squid brain! Uftok yelled at him as he got back to his feet. That's why we throw them! Defro's idiocy had left him with a bunch of shrapnel in his right hand side, but it was nothing he couldn't deal with later. The Umis, on the other hand, hadn't fared so well. The one Defro had hit most recently had taken the brunt of the impact, which was now rather red and squishy. And even those further back weren't in a good way, rolling around, wailing and crying like a grot that swallowed a fire squig. Seems like a design flaw to me. Defro muttered, pushing himself up. He winced and shook his mangled hand as the finger that had only been attached by a shred of flesh pinwheeled off. Ow, oh, that's smart. Now look what you did. Uftok complained at him. They're running away. Surely enough, the remaining Yumis had clearly decided that enough was enough, and they were turning tail fleeing from the slaughter. Or at least, they were trying to. Those of Snazhammer's mobs who weren't still picking themselves up because of the idiotic neighbor had blown everyone up, were jumping on the Umis from behind and sending them to see their emperor. Umis liked to yell about their emperor a lot, but Uftok had once heard a bunch of really tough beakies and spiky armor shouting that the emperor was dead. With worshippers like this, he could see why. He raised his slugger and shot one in the back, but his heart wasn't in it. A high-pitched whine grabbed Uftok's attention. For a moment, he thought it was the after-effects of Defro's stick bomb going off, but then he saw a crackle of blue power and one of the machines lurched into life. It was a big truck of some sort, with wheels taller than an orc. Uftok Blackhawk was a blood axe. Oh, Zog, he muttered fervently. Boss, you got your Emma? Don't worry about that. Snazhammer retorted confidently, spinning his hammer and casually decapitating a stray grot with his backswing. The Umi stuff breaks if you look at it funny. Uftok had his doubts. Umis might not be good in a proper scrap, but their guns tended to be the business. The dirty little gits also had a nasty habit of aiming, instead of pulling the trigger and letting Gork and Mork decide what would land and what wouldn't, as was right and proper. The big truck fizzled noisily and glowed brighter. Uftok braced himself. He had a feeling this was going to hurt more than a carelessly detonated stick bomb. There was a tremendous sound of tortured, tearing metal from behind them, as a huge shape came tearing across the chamber's floor, careering off Yumi machines and leaving wailing red robes it struck as mere red smears. It collided with the gun truck, which exploded in a ball of blue fire and came to a halt. Hatches popped open, and the boys emerged bellowing in anticipation. Told you we wasn't the only old breaker flying today, Snazhammer said with satisfaction. He raised his voice in a mocking shout. What happened to you gits? Got lost? The other mob boss responded with a rude hand gesture, and Snazhammer laughed. Right, on with the job, Boffin. You know where we're going. Through a lot of doors, as it turned out. Beats me how these Umis ever get anywhere. Mogrok commented as Wazok fired up his burner to cut through yet another sealed hatch. They know how to open them. Uftok snorted. We know how to open them. Magrat protested, pointing at where Wazok was dragging a white-hot line down the hatch. Open them without burners, Uftok said patiently. Magrat was hot squig dung in a fight, no doubt about it. But he wasn't what you would call a thinker. That was why Uftok was second in command, even though they were more or less the same size. They're locking us out, right? 
Don't seem too bothered with you then. Magrat countered. We ain't oddly had no one to fight since that scrap when we got out of the old breaker. He nudged a red-robed corpse with his boot, but the mob outnumbered this bunch of umis, and they'd barely been worth the effort. There's a whole bunch of lads on this ship by now, Snazhammer put in. So the umis don't twig what we're up to. They're what the umis call a destruction. He raised his weapon and activated the power field. All right, out of the way. The lads parted, and the boss stepped forward. He swung his hammer, and with a crack of boom like thunder, the burner bisected door caved as if it were made of sticks. It revealed a long corridor, wide enough for five orcs abreast. A few yards down, it were another bunch of red robes aiming their guns somewhat shakily at the gaping hole where their door had been. Snazhammer lunged forward, swinging his weapon two-handed by the very base of the handle to maximize its reach. The powered heads smashed through their squishy umi bodies and killed most of them with a single blow. The other two turned to flee. Snazhammer let them get a few steps before hurling his hammer at them, decapitating them both, one after the other. The mighty weapon skidded to a halt, slippery with red umi blood. Snazhammer turned to look at the boffin. Definitely this way, right? The boffin held up a clicking gizmo and revved the motor of his monowheel excitedly. Yup, we got super strong warp stuff down the other end. That's where we needs to be. You heard the orc. Snazhammer bellowed. Get to it. He turned back towards his hammer and began to stride down the corridor. Uftok was just taking his first step after the boss when the door at the other end of the corridor slid open. Not thanks to the destructive activities of some other lads, but by the smooth action of a machine operated by someone who knew how to work it properly. A huge shape slid into view, blocking out much of the light behind it. Now that, Magrat said from behind him, looks like a proper fight. It was on two legs, but it wasn't an Umi, and it wasn't an orc either. Uftok reckoned it was at least twice his height, and nearly the same across. It sort of looked a bit like a Umi Dread, the kind the Beaky sometimes had, but not quite. It had two power claws, the weird round Umi ones, instead of a proper pointy claw like any self-respecting orc would have, and some sort of a heavy shooter looming over its right shoulder. Tin boy! The boffin explained with what sounded like real excitement. Always wanted to see one of those up close. The heavy shooter opened up just as Bandit Snazhammer broke into a roaring charge. He got three strides before his head exploded into a welter of gore and pulverized bone, and he dropped as dead as a swatted squig. Zogan Eck! Uftok yelled. Back round the corner, lads! Shoppish! The tin boy was tracking its shots towards them, and in the confines of the corridor there was nowhere to take cover. He shouldered Death Row aside and scrambled back out of the line of fire. And a moment later, the rest of the mob joined him, hunkering down either side of the doorway. More thuds of the shooters sent gouts of blood spraying across the corridor's floor and over the threshold of the ruined door, as a couple of stragglers got well and truly crumped. As soon as there were no more orcs in view, the tin boy's gun went silent. What'd you run for? Magrod demanded from the other side of the gap. Uftok found faces turning towards him, red eyes focusing on him. He'd given a command, and the boys had followed him. The only problem was, he'd told them all to run away. That wasn't going to wash for long. If he wanted to stake his claim as the boss, he had to prove himself once and for all as the bigger orc. That wasn't running, he declared firmly. That was a strategic withdrawal. If it looks like a squiggith, and it smells like a squiggith, Magrat began menacingly. He drew himself up, fingering the activation switch on his chain chopper. I don't think he's proper boss material. Uftok, don't think you should be giving orders. Yeah? Uftok shot back, making a rude hand gesture. Why don't you walk over here and say that? Agrat growled deep in his chest and took one step, then paused frowning, distrustfully at the gap between them. Uftok tried not to look at the same bit of floor, but it was no good. Even Mogrot's brain had remembered why they were hiding in the first place. Give me a grot, Mogrot grunted. Reaching out behind him, one of the mob's hangers-on was seized and passed forwards with a squeak of protest, and Mogrot tossed it into the corridor. The tin boy's shooter opened up immediately, and the sad, mangled remains of the grot thudded to the floor. Doc cursed inwardly. 
That would have been hilarious, as well as useful. Nothing for it, then. We need to kill the tin boy, he declared, as though Magrot had never challenged him. And we ain't doing that from here, and we can't get to it to kill it easy, because it knows we orcs, right? The lads nodded. All that seemed logical. What you thinking? The boffin asked, scratching one ear and looking at him thoughtfully as he rocked back and forth on his monowheel. Uftok beamed. All right, lads. I've had an idea. Hello, I'm a Umi. Umi spaceships, it turned out, had a lot of decent metal sheeting lying around if you had access to a burner to cut it off the walls. So Wazok had been put to work, and before too long, the mob had several large chunks to which they'd strapped the more intact of the red-robed corpses they'd made on the way to the door. He's just Umi's walking down this corridor. Hoftok's plan was proper cunning if he said so himself, which he did, so that was okay. The tin boy must be able to tell Umi's from orcs, or the Umi's would never let it walk around their spaceship. Therefore, it stood to reason that if it saw Umi's in front of it, it wouldn't shoot. Into the corridor they went, a few boys behind each metal plate with the dead Umi's in the front to confuse the tin boy. Simple, but genius. What if it don't work? Defro hissed. It's gotta work. Uftok argued. I'm talking an Umi, ain't I? And I'm making my voice squeak yet. The shooter opened up again. The three boys behind the foremost plate leaned into the impacts of what suddenly became a makeshift shield, but the metal sheeting wasn't designed to stand up to the five power of that magnitude. One of them came apart as a shell punched right through, and Uftok suddenly had guts all over his steel toe caps. Zog it! He shouted. Next plan! The boys hadn't got far down the corridor before the tin boy had rumbled them, but they'd reached Snazhammer's body. They dropped their apparently useless Umi shields and opened up, pouring fire into their enemy, which stopped short of reaching it, swallowed up and destroyed by some sort of force field. I've had enough of this! Uftok growled as another orc was blown apart. He reached his back and pulled out what he decided to call a bomb stick, which was basically half the mob's stick bombs taped together, courtesy of de Boffin's toolbox. And by basically, he meant exactly. He took a quick two-step run-up and hurled it over arm. When that hit the tin boy's force field, it was like the force of Gork had stamped on them all. Uftok's vision cleared for a moment or so before his ears stopped ringing, and he picked himself up and peered down the corridor. The Mork damn thing was only still standing, wasn't it? That was supposed to blow its bloody arms off. Mogrot yelled. Never mind, Uftok shouted. It's stunned, isn't it? Scrag the Zoggin thing. He ran forwards, snatching up the snaz hammer as he passed it. Sure enough, the tin boy was standing wonky and making confused buzzing noises. Shots began to fly past him from behind, and this time one or two of them raised sparks as they struck home. The force field had been overloaded. Lenses in the tin boy's face whirred as the machine suddenly seemed to recover itself and the heavy shooter lowered to target them. Uftuk threw himself into a slide as the big weapon began kicking out shots again. He felt the shiver of impacts as they chewed up the floor behind him. The tin boy's power claws crackled into life as the whatever tech powered it realized he was getting close. But it was a shade too slow. It lunged for him, looking for crush him but he was already sliding between its legs and lashing out with a snaz hammer, which bounced clean off with barely a scratch caused, since he hadn't activated the power field. Mork's teeth! The tin boy lurched around to follow him, alarmingly fast for such a big thing. The heavy shooter remained steady somehow, pouring shots into the boys that had been following him, but the two power claws were all for Uftuk. It swung on him again, and he barely dodged back from it, then ducked under the counter swing from the other arm. When the tin boy tried to clobber him on the backswing, he set his feet and swung the snaz hammer to meet it. He activated the power field this time and took the tin boy's arm off at the elbow. Laughter erupted out of him as the huge thing staggered, its balance thrown off by the sudden lack of weight on one side. The sound of its detached power claw skittering away across the deck, the sound of triumph. Then it punched him in the chest with the other one. Uftok had never known such pain. He'd taken shots from a beaky gun that had left half his insides hanging out until Doc Drawsfang had stuck them back in and stitched them up. Once the fighting had calmed down a bit, it was as if someone had let buzzer squigs the size of grots loose on his chest, and that was before he flew backwards and hit the wall behind him hard enough to dent it. He lay there for a moment, vision foggy, as the tin boy turned its attention back to the rest of the boys, 
They'd now reached it and were hacking away with it with choppers, blasting it point blank with their shooters, and were surely going to bring it down any moment now. They didn't need him to help. He could catch his breath any moment now. Zog it, Uftuck muttered as another boy got pulped by the tin boy's remaining power claw. If you want something done right. He levered himself back to his feet, ignoring the sensation and indeed the smell of scorched flesh coming from his front, and took up the snaz hammer again. Oi, I ain't finished with you yet. The tin boy didn't turn around, which was its second mistake. The first had been to make sure that he wasn't properly dead first. He ran at its back, crackling snaz hammer held high and smashing the axe side into the armor plating. Kaboom! The tin boy spasmed and fell forward, circuits overloading and sparks shooting in all directions. Uftuk forced his own battered body to climb atop it, then raised the snaz hammer for the killing blow, laughing as he did so. Let Magrot try to lead the mob after this. He saw the boffin raising one hand in apparent warning just as he brought the weapon down for the final time. Everything went red. He was on his back. When his brain was actually working well enough again to figure out what was going on, he stared up at the ceiling, which looked blackened and scorched, as though a massive explosion had washed across it. He could hear the sound of orc boots tramping past him, but no one seemed to be stopping to congratulate him on his kill. A face appeared in his line of sight. It was Doc Drasfang, who was wearing what Uftok thought was a considering face, which was never a sight an orc wanted to see. Doc, Uftok managed, although it was surprisingly hard to speak. I can't feel me legs. Well, there's a reason for that. The Doc shrugged. Look down. Uftok managed to do what Draws Fang suggested. For a moment, he couldn't work out what he was seeing. Then he realized it's what he wasn't seeing what was the issue. Where's me legs? One's over there, Draws Fang said, pointing out of Uftok's view. Not too sure about the other one, or your arms, to be honest. Dad explain why they aren't hurting? Uftuck muttered. He frowned. What about the hammer? Mugrot's got it, Draws Fang replied. Said he's the boss now, and no one argued with him. Ungrateful grots, Uftuck managed. It was definitely becoming a problem, which was only to be expected when you look to be missing the bottom half of your lungs. Well, see us off then, Doc. No points waiting. May as well get back to Gork and Mork so they can put me in another body, and I can get back to fighting again. Drawsfang frowned. Yeah, about that. What if I was a better idea? Upduck tried not to let his trepidation show. Pain boys were useful to have about when you needed stapling back up, or a new arm sewing on but some of them could be a bit creative at times, especially when the patient wasn't in the condition to have much say in the matter. Nah, you're all right, Doc, he said, managing a grin. Nothing to worry about, is it? Yeah, well, I ain't thinking Magwad is the best boss the mob could have. Draz Feng replied, lowering his voice. I reckon they could do with the sort of orc with the smarts to plan for a tin boy. And has the guts to bring it down. And if I could fix up that orc, maybe he'd remember the pain boy what fixed him. Cause I reckon that orc might be going places. You know what I mean. Whatever you's thinking, you better have do it quick. Uftok told him flatly, as the darkness began to encroach on his vision. Frankly, the raw materials are at hand. Drawsfang grinned and pursed his lips to emit a piercing whistle. High-pitched grunts and swearing heralded the arrival of the Doc Scrot's disorderlies, apparently towing something heavy. They had stopped next to Uftok, and he had turned his head to look at it. It was Badgit Snazhammer's body, huge, battle-scarred, and untouched apart from the small point of completely lacking a head thanks to the Tin Boy. Ow, Draws Fang said, producing an intimidatingly large cleaver and placed the base at Uftok's neck. This may hurt a bit. Uftok hadn't really registered the blow given the percentage-wise, he wasn't really losing much more than he had already. The staples that the doc used to fix his head onto Snazhammer's neck, which had been tidied up with the same cleaver, only registered as a minor pricks of discomfort. What really hurt was the injection. 
you be looking at a day or so before you up and about normally. Shazbang told him matter-of-factly, as burning agony began to spread downwards from what remained of his neck into what had until recently been snaz hammers. The doc tucked his syringe back into his belt. But thanks to Doc Drazfang's healing juice, the nerve endings will connect right up and you'll have full control in a matter of minutes. Of course, there is always the side effects. He added. Uftuk tried to swear at him, but he was too busy convulsing. The tin boy looked to have been the Humi's last real line of defense of their fancy working bits, as Snazhammer called them. There were a few bodies scattered here and there on the route to the massive double doors from which an eldritch glow was emerging, but little sign of an organized resistance. The alarms going off suggested that perhaps the mech lord's destruction techniques had been extremely effective. All Uftuk knew is that they weren't helping his headache much. Here we are, boss, Drazfang said with a grin, gesturing at the one open door. The rest of the lads should be in there. Time to make your grand entrance. Uftuk bared his fangs, squared his, or possibly Snazhammer's shoulders, and strode in as though his neck weren't still leaking a bit, and his left leg weren't dragging slightly. It was a vast space, as big as one of the Umi's buildings, which they seemed to simply put up and sit in, to have a proper good think about their emperor. However, whereas those had lots of empty space in it, perhaps in order for the thoughts to fly around properly, this one was jam-packed full of stuff, was the only term Uftuk could come up with. Huge metal pillars gave off a glow that only partially obscured the runes carved into them, enormous pistons crackling with energy, giant wheels larger than his outstretched arms, and yet, despite how impressive it looked, there was a distinct impression that this place wasn't fulfilling its function. It was almost heavy with potential, an almost palpable heaviness in the air. It was as though the room itself were yearning for something, which probably wasn't the boffin and magrot red tooth having a scuffle, but that's what it currently had. Gear off it. I'm the boss. I get to push the button. You's gonna break it. You stupid. Gonna break your face in a minute. Magrat, facing away from Uftok, Reared back with the snaz hammer in his grip, ready to knock the boffin's lights out. Uftok grabbed it just under the head and yanked it out of his grip. Magrot whirled around, fumbling at his belt for his chain chopper, but pulled up short when he came face to chest with Uftok, his brow creased with uncommon cogitation. What the Zog? Something like that. Uftok agreed and nutted him. Magrat went down. Uftuk winced and reflected that probably hadn't been the smartest thing to do with staples in your neck. But what has been done was done, and he brandished the snaz hammer over his head. Anyone else want to be boss? There was a distinct lack of volunteers. The rest of the lads took a sudden interest in their boots. They hadn't been sure if Badgin had suddenly grew a new head or if Uftuk a new body. But they weren't planning to argue with him either way. That settled then. Uftok said with satisfaction. He could almost feel Doc Drazfang grinning behind him, but that was fine. Fair was fair. He would see that Doc would get his due. A few extra teeth passed his way, the occasional volunteer for surgery, that sort of thing. You done your mech thing yet? He asked the boffin, who shook his head. Magrot wanted to press the button. Well, get on with it. He wasn't interested in pushing buttons. That sounded like a mech job. The buffin's device was surprisingly small, and was clamped to what looked like some sort of Umi control panel. It had three buttons on it. Stop, Go, and Mega Go. What is that anyway? Uftok asked. This? The buffin said gleefully. Is the warp decapitator. You know how Umis choose where they're gonna fly through the warp? Yeah, said Uftok, who didn't. Well, they leave tracks behind in the wall, sort of like squig trails, only nothing like that, the buffin explained. These are Umi mech boys, so they probably came from an Umi mech boy planet, where there's loads of shiny tech the mech lord can nab. Right. Uftuck nodded. Shiny tech sounded good. The mech lord would get the best, obviously. But that didn't mean there wouldn't be some left over. So when I turn this on, 
It uses the energy of these warp engines to cause a catastrophic warp implosion. Uftog frowned. Is that good? Course it's good. The boffin scuffed. It's got lots of th thingies, syllables in it, like grot is bad, but where's boom blaster jet is good. Uftog nodded. It was a powerful argument. This ship gets stuck into the warp, right back to the stun point of the last warp jump it made, and then pops back out again. The buffin continued. And it sucks the rest of the ships around in with it too, including the mech lord's fleet. Jobs are good un. He reached out and pressed the button labeled Mega Go. The control panel sparked. More alarms started sounding. But these weren't high-pitched whiny klaxons that denoted a relatively minor problem, like rampaging murderous orcs aboard the ship. These were bone-deep and throbbing, and bore an inherent sense of panic. If a star could have screamed a warning, it would have sounded something like that. All around Uftok and his mob, the glowing, crackling parts of the room began to move, slowly at first, then faster and faster. Uftok frowned. He could have swore that something solid had passed through something also equally apparently solid. Is that supposed to act? There was a stomach-churning resonant blorp, and everything turned inside out. It took Uftok a few minutes to check his arms weren't now five miles long, or that his stomach hadn't si uh, swelled to the size of a planet, both of which felt like they could have been viable options. He definitely had an annoying tick in his left eye, but that was less unusual, and he glowered at the boffin with it. If that's your definition of good. The boffin held out his hand for quiet. Uftok was about to clobber him for the disrespect when he heard it too. It was the screaming of tortured metal, and that, Uftok realized, was not fancy words. It was the voice of actual metal, and it was actually screaming, and the whole thing was overlaid with a bubbling, wet giggle. From outside in the corridor came the slithering thump of something malformed dragging its huge bulk along with nothing more than brute strength and an endless malice directed at all living things. Course, the buffin commented, there's always the side effects. All right, lads, Uftuk barked, laying about him. The boys hadn't coped well with the catacrumpic warm diffusion, or whatever it was the buffin had said and most of them were still lying on their backs or counting their fingers to see if they still had the same amount, which was causing some problems in Death Row's case. As he couldn't now remember how many he had started with, a few knocks with the half end of the hammer got them back into it, however. That's entertainment's coming. Up you get. The other massive door slammed back, and something made of blood and steel and endless hunger squirmed in, all sharp teeth and barbed tongues and glistening black talons that reached out hungrily for flesh. Uftuk grinned at it. Time to see what this new body could do. On me, lads. One, two, three. Wah! Thanks for listening, you guys. This is my first audiobook that I've done completely by myself, so if you could leave some comments in the comment section letting me know what you thought, or maybe some other short stories, hopefully including orcs, that you would like to hear. Maybe I'll get on to those in the future. Thanks for listening, and have a nice day.